Good evening. They gave me the signal, so I know it's my turn now. Um, let's have a word of prayer before we start, if you don't mind kneeling. Dear Lord, thank you so much for one more week that you have given us. Thank you for the labor that strengthen us, our body, our minds, and help us to be a little bit more like you. We thank you for the strength to do it, and we thank you for the rest that you give us every week. May we enter your rest in all the ways that you want us to do so. But now, before the Sabbath comes, we are here together to honor you. We are here together to learn more about your wonderful plans for us. And we ask for that, that the great teacher, that your Holy Spirit will be among us. May you speak to our minds and to our hearts. May you give me the words to speak so that your will will be made known, that we'll be reminded of all that you want to do to us, the formation and the transformation. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Good afternoon. Did you have a good Friday? I hope so. It's the preparation day, right? So I see that everybody showered and everybody's ready, looking their best. And what a better place to be than the house of the Lord to start the Sabbath, right? And um, you guys had the chance to know a little bit more about my family. You, the ones that were here in the morning, had the chance to hear the testimony of my children. And um, like they said, it's, sometimes it's hard for them because for them it's just normal. So it is like saying what mostly they think everybody's living their lives. And, um, but now as time goes by, they see some differences that, and they, we, we are receiving people at our home. Uh, the Lord has been sending some youth to, to be with us for a while. And as they tell about their daily chores or lives in the school and what they go through, they are having a glimpse of how blessed they are. So, um, and that's one thing that has been a, a great blessing for myself too. The Lord, as my children grow up, he has uh, differentiated a little bit the, the work that he has given me. I thought that when my children were around 16, I remember even telling in a group of parents that my work was basically done. How wrong was I? <laughs> now I know a little better, and I see some uh, beautiful white hair say, laughing at me and saying like, Never done, right? We always, children are always children. And um, when my, my father passed, I understood that I was still his child because I miss terribly his prayers. You know, he was a man of prayer, and I knew he was praying for myself and my family. So I really, really miss that. And when my, my grandmother passed away, I knew that her children would be hurting because she was always praying for the 12 of them. And um, I took upon myself at that time that I would do that since she had passed and many of them were not Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, so she will have such a surprise in heaven because the Lord has answered her prayer almost to the last one. So I'm very, very, very thankful for all the prayers that, you know, sometimes comes through generation. So let it be known, known to you, if you didn't find out yet, that uh, all that we do is just a little drop compared to the prayers and the way the Lord can answer them. I have been sometimes to the point that I said, Lord, I have done all that I know how to do. 
I don't have anything else and things are not working the way it should work. And sometimes I was scared. And you think, how can that be? At that time, the Lord really impressed me to pray even more. It was the time that I would, he would wake me up in the middle of the night, and I knew he was calling me to pray. And I start praying in my bed, and then I start going to my children's uh, bedside, and I start praying for them there more and more. And I've seen that the battles were fought and won there. So we do all that we can, but it still is not enough. It is not enough. So we need to, to go the, the other step. I left to tell some things today that um, would be better said today than on the Sabbath. So I'm going to talk about the study books of God. I know I'm not a good one for the camera because I move a little bit more, so I ask forgiveness for the cameramen and women that are around. And I'll try to be as uh, still as possible. It's not easy for me. But um, we had seen about how the Lord beautifully planned the school. What was the school supposed to be? Where was the school supposed to be? Yes, it was in the home, and the home was supposed to be in the garden. What a beautiful combination. And before God himself and the angels were our teachers, but after sin, he placed us as his representative. So we were not all taught of God straight, but we would have some intermediation, intermediation there. And it would be the parents. What a great task, right? But we saw, too, that the parents failed. The Lord can work with anybody, even with slaves, just coming out of slavery, right? And he can work with them. So he can work with any of us. But it was when the parents neglected their obligations toward God and neglect their obligations toward their own children that the Lord had to intervene again. And then he established what? The school of the prophets. And we are here in sacred, holy ground, one of such schools. And I'm so thankful. When we were talking this morning, my children were talking about social life. Um, that was one thing that was a big blessing for us. When my children start reaching that age, my son was about 16, and we saw that we were they were losing many of the fr their friends to the world. And it was very sad because some of them were homeschooled. And you say, how can that be? And we saw some things that contribute to that. Sometimes one parent going one way and the other one being more slack. And so this, you know, not being consistent, and that's something that is very, very important. And we have discussed that, the consistent consistency of the parents, to be in agreement and united, and that we, we are faithful in following what we say. We remember one family that very dear to us, but they would make some exceptions. You know, sometimes if it was a, a birthday, they, had, they were strict in their diet, but then they could do some things, you know, and not be vegan anymore, not be. And the problem is, if you are not, it's okay. But if we teach them that this is the right way, is the way that the Lord wants, and then we start breaking and making exceptions, the children feel that it's okay to make exceptions. And finally, the exceptions become rules. And they will start making exceptions, not just in what their parents make exceptions. They will start making exceptions in whatever they feel like here and there. Another thing that was very um, difficult, and it is difficult to manage. I've been studying a lot about that, and it's those little, should I say blessings or curse? You know, the uh, electronic device. And we saw some of our children had gone astray because of that in our church. And 
the problem is we have them in our home and we think they are safe and secure, they are in their rooms, but we don't understand that if their mind is not there, it doesn't matter if their body is. Because, you know, this is a window, a window sometimes to the world and sometimes to hell. It, I'm not saying we should not use, I use, but we are very careful at home. The, my children, it was a long, took a long time for them to get their own cell phone. It was just when my son went to college and when my daughter went to uh, work last year. They could use mine, and we had some agreements, but it is, we cannot be away from it completely. I, I'm not preaching that. If somebody can, it's okay, too. But um, children, even for physical reasons, should not be exposed to cell phones because their cranium is thinner than the adult, and the radiation, the electromagnetic waves, impact them much more. A toddler, for example, one minute that a toddler is exposed to um, electromagnetic waves, even in their parents' pocket, because they are small, they are close by, it will disturb the electricity in their brain for one hour. Can you imagine that? And how does the Lord communicate with us? Through the electricity in our brains, exactly. So it is not a small thing. We are not, that's not the theme of our uh, conversation here, but it's just, I'm just, you know, touching those things because I've seen many uh, children that really went in a different path guided by this light, right? <laughs> so let's be careful with that. But uh, in the School of the Prophets, what kind of uh, school was that? Was that a school, a kind of, since the parents were not doing what the Lord asked them to do, the school of the prophets was established to bring these children of these homes and to fix them for the Lord, right? Yes? Well, not quite. I thought about that too, so we are all in the same line. But what is told to us in the, in the education, book education, in the chapter that talks about the school of the prophets, is that the Lord chose for, to be students in the school of the prophets, the, the young people that were intelligent, studious, and pious. Exactly. Who said that? Somebody's been studying here. Uh -huh. Exactly. So, the school was not to fix the children from the parents that did not teach them in the ways of the Lord, but was to help the parents to and to empower these young people to be leaders in the nation and to teach the people that had lost their ways. Isn't that amazing? So the ones that are here are chosen as prophets not because they had visions of the Lord, but because they were um, the spoken voice of the Lord for those that didn't hear in another way. So in these schools, they would learn the ways, and because of these schools, we are not going to go into details in, into it, but because of these schools, thanks to them, it is said that uh, the kingdom of Solomon and the king of David that reached their highest point was thanks to the youth that went out from the school of the prophets. Isn't that amazing? But if we just look back, David himself learned where? At home. He didn't go to the school of the prophets. He learned at home. But the young people that came in the school of the prophets made the work so much easier that a leader could really lead them to the Lord. Beautiful, beautiful. And what they learned in the school of the prophets, it was things that we usually think it's superfluous, right? What did they learn? First, they learned to work 
if they didn't work, they, they pay their way through work. Second, they learned the word of the Lord, but not just that, they learned to pray. They learned to understand and to apply to their lives those words, the word of the Lord. And they learned some things that I thought, wow, how can that be? And it was poetry and song. Why would they have to learn poetry and song and not those philosophies and so many other things that we still have to learn today, right? Because they were learning to express their feelings and to praise the Lord in songs and poetry. And we know that songs are very, very powerful. So we have to be very careful. You guys here know that, that we have to be very careful when it comes into the ears of our children in form of song. Because those things have the ability to go straight without going through the filter of our frontal lobe. And some music that's very interesting, like jazz, they do the opposite. They turn off the frontal lobe. They studied jazz musicians, and when they are playing, what happens is that their frontal lobe is kind of turned off. Can you imagine that? So they are open for any influence if they don't have the filter where the Lord can speak directly. But from the school of the prophets that was supposed to teach the nations, we go the next time we see school, when is that? We see the school of the prophet that were they for the little children? No. For whom? Again? The youth, the young people. And what kind of young people? Yes, the same kind that is here, I hope, today to study this next year. And it's the students that are intelligent, studious, or dedicated, right? And pious, that really love the Lord and dedicate their lives to the Lord. So, the next time we see schools again, where is that in the Bible? Who can tell me? School of the prophets, first time, because the parents didn't do their work as they should. Next time? New Testament. A hint. Huh? Oh, I like that school. At Mary's feet. Yeah, that's the good school. But they had other kind of school. What school was that? Yes, exactly. They had the local schools, right? That the Pharisees and the rabbis would guide the youth. And um, that was the school that was for the young people, just the young people? No, it was for the children already. How do we know that? Children would go, we have in the history, and the, the Jewish history has that. Um, and we know that they came and wanted Jesus to go there. And they came personally, and they insisted that Jesus go there. Why did they have to insist that Jesus would go to their school? Because he was not there. That's why they had to do it. And why, why wasn't Jesus there? Wasn't that the, a religious school? Yes, it was. So why wasn't Jesus in that school? Um, excuse me? That's exactly it. He was being homeschooled. Um, I lost my location. Uh, here it is. Oh, no, it is not. It is earlier here. It, it is in the chapter 8 of the book Education. And is a teacher sent from God. Who is that teacher? Jesus himself. Okay. Jesus followed the divine plan of education. It said in page 77, paragraph 2. Jesus followed... What plan of education? Divine. The divine plan of education. You're awake. Thank you. The schools of his time. Which schools is it be talking about? Of the rabbis, exactly. The school of his time. With their magnifying of things small and their belittling of things great, he did not seek. 
wow, what were they studying there in the school of the rabbis? Human traditions, but they were studying what too? Scriptures. They had to memorize the scriptures. And sometimes they memorized, you know, the, the whole five books. And when they were, would grow older, they would memorize more. So why is it saying that they were magnifying of things small and belittling of things great? Well, we see that when Jesus starts teaching afterwards. And he talks about that, doesn't he? He talks about them, uh, what's the word in English? Filtering the nets, you know, and uh, how is the word? Yes, exactly. So we see that they were preoccupied with the small traditions. They would get the Bible but interpret at their own will. And the big things of the law, that was what? The love they were forgetting. That was the mercy they were forgetting. Everything related to the character of God himself, they were belittling and making their own ways big. But listen now. Now we see how God did it. So he didn't go to those schools, right? Although they were Christian schools. His education was gained directly from the heaven-appointed sources. So, from... Now, it's four. I'll give you a hint. There are four sources. Who knows what they are? What? Oh, useful work. You went right on target. Somebody else went right on target too. Nature. So useful work, nature. What else? Scriptures. Exactly. We have three here. We are just lacking one. You guys are good. No, that is inside of the, the scriptures itself. Life experience, exactly. Wow, you are the first group that got all four. Congratulations. You are studying your books. I like that. Exactly. Those are the, the ways appointed by, the appointed by heaven. Those are the sources. From useful work, from the study of the scriptures and the study of nature and from the experience of life. What are they? God's lesson books full of instructions to all who bring to them. Ah, now there is the condition. For every promise, there is a condition. For the lesson books of the Lord, there are the conditions. The full of instructions to all that bring to them the willing hand, the seeing eye, and the understanding heart. So to learn from it, it, doesn't, it cannot be forced. It has to be what? Willing hands for the labor. It has to be for nature and for the scriptures what? Seeing eyes. You cannot just force feed the children the instruction, the information. It has, we have to arise their minds for that. And not just their minds, but what? It was the seeing eyes and the, what kind of heart? The understanding heart. You know, sometimes we want children to memorize, and that's wonderful. It is marvelous that they do that. But there is, it has to be more. It has to be with what? Understanding, exactly. So let's talk a little bit about those um, four things. And I've been marveled, marveling at the power of those things. Um, like I told you, I've been receiving uh, young people when the Lord sent them to me. And, uh, but then it's one thing, have you heard uh, the importance of the first how many years? The first? Oh, we have some ages here, and you are all right. You know, the first, somebody said seven years. That's right. Sister White mentions exactly that. But she has a number before that. And what is that? The three, the first three years. And I was talking to uh, Regina, Regina, and the table, one of this... Uh, times in the cafeteria 
And uh, it is amazing. She was talking about things that she has been, she was learning at Harvard about uh, children education and how it goes exactly with the spirit of prophecy. And I'm, I'm always studying science because I love it. You know, the true science is always revealing the Lord. And in the first three years, there's something very interesting that happens. The, the children's neurons are not just there and learning and developing in that acquiring things, but they are multiplying. And they start multiplying so much that they will have more neurons at that age than an adult and they will ever have in their lives. And because of that, they will learn in those first three years that science saying more than they will in the rest of their lives. Imagine how much they are sucking from everywhere. The first three years. How important it is that there is somebody there teaching them in the right way. Because their seeing eyes are capturing everything. Their ears are learning and capable of learning every language. And many languages at simultaneously. They are able to, their bodies are developing so fast and their coordination is developing so well that they come from an infant that cannot do anything, not even you know, put their, their hands in their mouth. To at three, I remember my children, I was always in awe because they could walk, they could talk, they could understand my commands, and they could go and fulfill them. I was just Amazed, and I never thought that it could do. You know, you study the development, but when you see yourself, you say, how much they have learned. And it's true, but something happens around that time. Do you know that when you have a tree, and I'm not too good in doing this, is the pruning. Do you have a hard time pruning like I do? I have a hard time pruning, you know, because I'm thinking, oh, this can give fruits. But the thing is, the fruits will not be good because you are spreading out too much. So we have to prune, and that's a lesson from nature that is happening inside our own heads. At that time, there is a pruning process that happens. And what happens is that anything that is not being used, it is taken away. So they, have, they, become, they become less uh, abundant in neurons in their s nervous cells but they are now more directed toward what the parents are teaching. And listen to that, how interesting it is. Here in the United States, we are spending, because of this um, division, let's say, about the ones that have and the ones that have not, they, the children go to school, and sometimes they cannot um, keep up with the other children. So we, what is the solution? Take them earlier to school, right? So they will be able to learn more things earlier. They can learn their colors, they can learn the letters, they can, so we have a program that is called, what, pre-K, but before that? Head Start, that's exactly it. Head Start, so what do they do? They take the children earlier and they say, now we can teach them earlier and when they get to school, they will be able to. So since we are spending billions, yes, billions of dollars in that specific program, the government decided he wants to know the results that are coming from that. And what did he do? They did some research and the research showed that there was basically no difference. When they go there, they are still deficient. They become deficient in math, although they learn the numbers. They become deficient. They are deficient in the reading, although they learn the letters earlier. What is going on? And one university starts studying, and they invested on that. They put microphones in the houses of many people, 
and so they could know what was going on in different places. They found out that the big difference between usually the children that are from low income is that amount of words that are spoken to the children. And the amounts of words are so big that by the time that they reach 40, four years old, it is 40 million words that they didn't hear compared to the other children. So what is happening, and the words, not just the words, the amount of words, but the kind of words. It's usually uh, commands, and it's not words that entice them to think and to respond. This difference, this gap that happens in the first three years is one that is hard to overcome. Why again? Because some neurons, a big amount of neurons, are lost in that process. Do you remember, we are going to study a little bit tomorrow, but do you remember what the Lord tells how to teach our children in the Deuteronomy? What is it? Yes, talking to them as we wake up, rise up, as we walk with them, as we sit down. So he was giving us the recipe to help our children to learn more. This interaction, and we are going to talk more about communion and interaction. It's th those are the ways of the Lord for our education. But this difference, you know, up to th the three years old, and then we have around seven years old. This is another period that the Lord talks about between eight and ten or seven. And what happens there? Who knows? There is an efficiency, efficiency work that happens there. Well, now they have less neurons than they had before, right? Than they had at three years old. But those are becoming more specialized. And at this time, they become, you know, they are loosely connected. But at this time, they receive a coat. What is this coat? It's a coat, yes, it's a coat of fat that the axons receive, that the connections receive, so that the electric impulse can go faster. Remember the electric impulse that are disturbed with the cell phones and with the iPods and the iPads. iPods, I don't think they even have any more, but the, all these gadgets. And I don't know if you have noticed something. I don't know here, but... Uh, I've seen, I'm going to um, playgrounds and sometimes shopping malls. And what do I see? Do you see the same thing that I see? The little hands, what do they have? Yes, they have a screen. Now we sti even have covers that are better for the children to work on those screens, right? So instead of being seeing everything and aware of the smells and the sounds, they are just there. And their electromagnetic waves are just disturbing their little brains that are being formed. Electricity again. And why is that, that cover of fat, myelin, why is that covering that? So that the electric impulses can go faster. It's more efficient. The connections are more efficient. That's at around seven years old. And then there's another time, and is the time of puberty. Sister White talks about around 15. Have you seen that? You can put 15 there, and you see. And we know as a church that the young people, that's the golden age for people to come to the church. Because if they come, we have more people that come to church around that age and up to that age than we can get them later. We have to do much more effort to have them. At that age, what is happening? It's another boom. Another, I call it the second chance. Because again, during puberty, their neurons are growing, are multiplying like crazy. And what happened again? They, are, they have this growth spur, and then they are pruned again at the end of the teenager years.
And what happened at the time is, again, what's not being used is what? Loosed, right? So we have, I have two young men here that came to the United States to learn English. It is a good time to do so because at this time, you know, they are having that second chance. Even the violinists, I don't know if you know, but the left hand of the violinists, the correspondent part in their brain is much, much better developed, much bigger than the correspondent par uh, uh, part corresponding to the right hand. Why is that so? Because they use it much more. But that difference is not seen when the children before puberty. You know that sometimes they say, oh, they should start early, very early to learn violin because they will be much better. No. You know, that difference really shows up after puberty because they are using it and then it's solidifying and that is really making the pruning. So it prunes what's not being used much by the right hand and th there's a difference between the left. And we've seen that with my children because their hands even grow bigger, the ones that they use more. Isn't that amazing? So you don't use, you lose it. Now, we went for the, the work, right? We went for the four things. What are they again? Nature, scripture, we use for work and, yes, life experience. What are they again? The lesson books of God. So, if those are the lesson books of God, why are we so worried about what kinds of books I'm going to use? Maybe we are not using enough of the other ones. Could that be? But the other ones are the most important. Yes, Jesus learned how to read. And what was he reading? Scriptures. Scriptures. And it's interesting because we are told that Jesus could have thought, given information that would advance science for years and keep people studying for years, but he didn't give that information. Why not? If information is so important. We are in the information age, aren't we? And that's why we have to have our gadgets with us all the time. Well, if the information is so accessible, I don't have to worry about that. Maybe I should worry more about formation and transformation, right? Because information is something that can be acquired at any time. But formation will make the basis where they can really connect and gather the right information or not because the brain is being physically molded and it's interesting because the Lord uses it exactly that expression we're going to talk about that tomorrow but the brain is being you seen the pruning the use and what is doing the, what is really guiding that pruning is what we are doing with our children is what they are learning is that the information? Do you think it's the information that we are giving them? No, it's the experience that they are having. And this experience is really what will guide the interior. Why do I say that? How much do you remember of all that you learned in school? How many here went to school? Let me see the hands. Yes, a lot of people. So do you remember all those formulas? I know somebody that recently memorized the whole um, table of elements. Yeah. Raise your hand if you did that. Oh, we have more than one. Yeah. Leo, can you tell us all the table of the elements? Why not? You just mem How long did you do that? How long ago? Two huh? Two months ago. Oh, it's fresh in his mind. That is awesome. Can you tell us then? 
Did you do a test for that? Did you do well in your test? So you did memorize it. For the test. Mm. So you lost it. What about you? Certainly you remember them all. Some. Some. You see, those are information. If they are applied and lived, you would remember. If he was in a lab and working with those materials and he had to, to work with all those things, he would remember. But the information, how much do we keep of what we read? Do you know? 10%. We just lose 90%. Just that. If we learn well those, nine, those 100%, we keep 10 percent. What does it mean? If we are concentrating in information, you are putting a hundred hours and getting ten hours of useful thing, if that much, if the information is important, right? Because most of them are useless. Well, if I don't use, it's useless. How is that useless? So much of what I've learned. Remember asking, I don't know, I studied in Brazil, so maybe we thought differently there. But we, you, we would ask the teachers, some of us, some not, why do I need that for? Do you have that here too? And the teachers will tell you what? Yes, you need that for your life. You need it for later. I did chemistry. In, um, we have kind of vocational, so I really like chemistry, and what was, would prepare me for um, college. So I did chemistry. I memorized those tables, too. I memorized, I studied so much. Guess what I remember? I studied a lot of math. What do I remember? Sometimes my son, he went to engineering, and it's useful to say, I've remembered that name. I've studied that, you know. Ask me to do anything with it, I don't know how to do. So was it useful for me? No. Did I have to learn that? No. I had to learn things that were pertinent to the important things that I would do in life. But if you become an engineer, if you become an engineer, you learn it quickly because you are good in math, right? What really should we be learning? Practical things for life. We are told that, you know, before we go on studying those nafty and high things on math that most of us are not going to use ever, we should learn how to do what? To do a good accountants with our own finance. Isn't that important? So my son was talking about since he started, what, at 10 years old, when he started mowing the lawn, he was doing the the uh, money thing, the finance. No, he was not. He thought that. But when he, s he received his first dollar, he was doing what? Separating the tithe, separating the uh, offering, and the savings. That's exactly. So he knew pretty soon that that was part that was not his because, you know, those were for the Lord, and the other one was for future. And my daughter would cry every time she had to give the tithe and the offering and the savings. She would cry real tears. Is that painful now, daughter? No, it's not painful anymore. <laughs> you don't cry anymore, right? Now we give with a, a thankful heart because we understand. And I told her, you don't have to give, honey. The next time I have not pay you, so you don't have to give anything, <laughs> right? She got that pretty well. She understood that more she would give, it was a sign that more she was receiving. So, in another interesting thing that we are told, and it is that most youth would benefit from paying their own school. I read that before my son went to school. It was good. <laughs> Truly was not. You know, because he went to school and we were thinking, 
we can afford. We were planning on that. We can afford. It is so much easier for us than it is for him. Oh, my heart would really be heavy. And I'd say, well, you have to do. So we start helping him in the sense that we gave him work. And we would pay what we would pay for any other worker. And we would tell, if you do the work as the other worker would do. So he would learn how to do it. I, if he was doing lazily, he would not be paid as well. But, and then after that, he went, he got a job outside the home. He was very thankful for that, getting a job outside of the home. You know, you feel more manly, right, when you do that. And he felt that before he was saying, Mom, it doesn't sound really fair because it's kind of, I'm receiving from your pocket anyway. So in a, such a way, you are, you are paying for me. I said, yeah, but I have a new fence all oh, in the front of my house, right? <laughs> yeah, that's good. I like that. And many other things. So it was, he was learning there. And then, like he said, he started working for people in church, and that's something very important, that we see where our children are apprenticing because the, of the influence that they will have there, right? So he started working there, and it was a very... He was already in engineering school at that time, so it was a very elevated and noble work. You know, he was uh, making holes for for somebody to put the um, pipes for the electrical. the electrical. Okay, for what? For mobile home. So it was. I took pictures. You should see the pictures. We could not. Have be sure if it was him underneath all that dirt, especially when it was raining. Hard work. He would get home and we would be, you know, massaging his back because it was hurting. And I was concerned about his hands. He was used to do manual labor, but that one was really heavy. But it taught him all that the Lord said it was going to teach him. You know, many lessons he learned there. And he's not afraid of the work now. So the Lord can give him different kinds of jobs. And, you know, when I have young people come into my house, I, I usually am very happy that the Lord give us opportunity to give them some of this work. I had last summer, I had a young man coming, and you should see his face. He was an unhappy guy, very unhappy you know, not very nice to his mom. His mom came to, and uh, his sister. And if you would meet him in the road, you would probably cross the road. He, he didn't look like a nice guy. And, but you know, he was a criminal, you have to understand. He, was, he had already killed a lot of people. He had robbed, and probably he had committed some sexual crimes. Yes, he did, because every time he was doing that in the games, he was doing it, right? So whenever, whenever we look at a woman with impure eyes, aren't we? Yes, we are, right? Whenever we hate our brother and sister, aren't we, and we call him Raka, aren't we committing murder? Imagine if you are really doing it with the other one in your video game. And that starts pressing your face. It starts showing. And that's what was happening. And then one day, Christopher said, Mama, can I take him with me to my job? I said, yes, that would be a good thing. So he did. And he was there with him and another young man that was with us, working, making those, how do you call holes, <laughs> right, and in the rain, trenches, trenches, yeah, uh, and he went with them. You should see that young man when he came back. He was dirty as dirty could be and happy as happy could be. That was the beginning of his transformation. It was a miracle in front of us. We saw the value of the lesson book of the Lord. He worked and he told his mother next day, Mama, and she said, he's inviting you to go again next day. You have to wake up at 6 o'clock. But, you know, we don't know if the gentleman will pay you anything. 
He said, Mama, I don't have to get any money to go. I would go for free. And he went, and he worked hard all day long. And they invited him to go again and again and again. And then he got his, his first money, you know, that he earned. It was not because his mama gave him. It was because it was hard earned. And you know what he did with that money at the end? He brought to me. He said, here's to help with the expense that you had with me here. You are feeding us. You are helping us. And uh, my parents cannot give you much, so I want to contribute. Can you imagine? Of course, I didn't accept that. You know, I could not. I knew. But he, he really, really wanted to do. So what did he do at the end? Uh, he paid for the rental car from my house to the airport that was uh, six hours from there or seven hours from there. He paid with his own money. He had become unselfish. Before, he just wanted. He was lying. He was doing all things because his mom was trying to get his device from him, to get him away from the games when she noticed what was happening. And he was not happy about that. He would not participate in the worship. He would never give thanks. He didn't want anything with anything. And he left there. Such a happy young man, such a hard worker. And he went home, and now he wants to be homeschooled and he is being homeschooled there. And he's, he's working for his mom. And his mom comes, she told me, she comes out and she says, honey, why don't you go rest a little bit? Aren't you tired? And he says, mom, I'm a man. A man doesn't get tired. <laughs> he has a pride now, you know. He's proud of his work. And his mom is really happy. So why am I saying that? The, the books of the Lord, his four books, are the most important and teach them so much more than we can ever imagine you know in all rehabilitation center that really for drugs for electronics for whatever the ones that are the most successful involves what manual labor besides everything else and with this I'll finish um, I saw a research that they did and they found out that the connection of the hands, the hand with the brain is such that it activates the centers that are responsible, responsible for our mood. And they start thinking that the lack of manual labor and just typing doesn't count. It's really the labor is what is responsible for a lot of depression nowadays. So when the Lord gave Adam work in right in the beginning before sin, it was a blessing. When he gave hard work after sin was a double blessing. May we remember that the lesson books that the Lord gave are the most important. I'm not saying don't teach them to read. They have to do that for the Bible. I'm not saying that you, we don't have them reading other books and learning, but science can be learned straight from nature. That's where the scientists learn. We don't learn from the books. We learn, they learn from nature, and we get secondhand. You know, if we teach our children to observe, they will learn not just the information that they are getting there, but they will learn to see the God that made it all. They will be in contact with this God and learn to his character. When they see their, his artwork, they will start learning more about the artist. May the Lord help us to have faith in his methods, in his books, in his way of doing it. And we'll have results that are out of this world. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we are so, so thankful that your methods are not expensive, that they are free for all that want to use them, that the people that are the simplest can learn from it, that all that don't have the money 
to pay for grade schools or for to pay for books or material or computer can still learn from the best means that you have left for us. And in the process, can still make some money. Lord, help us to start seeing the labor the way you see it. Help us, help us to help the children to learn to love service. Help us never to complain about it but to give them an, an example of happiness, of seeing what the Lord sees, saw when he finished his labor. And he says that we can have the same feeling when we look at our labor and think it is good. Help us to do the way you want us to do with all our hearts, with our, all our strength. And help us, Lord, to be of service with whatever we do. We ask you these blessings, asking that you bless us in this Sabbath, that help us, help us, Lord, to keep our mind in you, that our thoughts, the words of our mouth, will be all for you, that we will not forget you, but that we will remember. We ask you in Jesus' name, amen.